religion has become quite strange. We have these churches out there that no longer look the same. Church to church to church, they've all begun going to this unique look. That's so unique that they're starting to look the same and, and the fact that none of them look the same. You never know what you're quite getting into. Used to be, religions were pretty standard. You walked into a place of worship, everything would look, to some extent, the same. You knew where everything was, left, right, center. Nowadays, who knows? Basically playing Russian roulette. Now, when it comes to a lot of the other religions, eh, people don't care too much. But in the Catholic religion, that's kind of a big deal. Because in our creed, it talks about being one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. One. There's only one of them. You don't have two, three, seven, ninety, nine hundred and thirty odd. No. There's just the one. And then you look around, you've got the... Roman Catholic right, and the Eastern Orthodox right, and the Greek Orthodox right. It's starting to not be very one anymore. Holy. Uh, do we really need to go on with what's holy? Right, we're supposed to be doing good things. But look at the recent scandals. Got numbers of priests doing all sorts of just just horrible, terrible things. And then you have bishops protecting them from the just retribution. Catholic. We're not just a name. It's not just a word that we throw out there. No, Catholic actually stands for universal. Not just across the globe, but across time as well. You should be able to go into any church built in any year and see the same things. Stations across along the walls tabernacle smack dab in the center a high altar and a low altar candles all over the place you've got stained glass windows same general shape as that of either an upturned boat or a cross but you don't see these things anymore and finally apostolic the apostles we all come from those first 11 apostles of Jesus. Of course, Judas fell away, so we can't really come from him. But the rest of them all became bishops. Although, of course, Peter being the pope, the first pope. And that's kind of the biggest piece that's starting to be eaten away that we haven't noticed yet. The other three, yeah, we see it. But the fourth one, the apostolic bit, we're not noticing it's being torn away as well. Unless you know where to look. Now when we're talking about the apostolic, we're talking about the fact that every priest is anointed by a bishop. And every bishop is anointed by another bishop. Then you have cardinals that were bishops at one point in time usually. And then the bishop of Rome referred to as the pope. They're all anointed, and they're anointing each other, but there is a chain, a chain of command, if you will. You always know where everybody else comes from, kind of like a family tree of sorts. However, there's a few ranks in there that people today don't think is any big deal, which is why the apostolic bit's kind of falling away. It's right there on the altar. What do you see? A priest? Yep. They get holy orders. Some places have deacons. They get a form of holy orders as well. Kind of the, the first step. In fact, every priest is a deacon at some point in time until they become that full-fledged priest. But usually when you see the deacons up there, they re are referred to as permanent deacons. As in, they'll never achieve priesthood, usually because they're married. In some churches, you may also see acolytes. But this is fading very, very, very quickly. People don't seem to know what an acolyte does. Sometimes they get refer rolled into what's actually starting to cause a problem 
in the church without us noticing it. And that's the altar boys. Yes, altar boys. Not altar servers, not altar girls, altar boys. The altar boys were brought up, designed to be a kind of a shadow program, if you will, to help young boys decide if the priesthood was something they were being called to do. They could already see what being a father looked like, being a dad, from their own families. But how are they going to get that ability to see what a priest does? Sure, go to Mass. No problems. But there's something about being on the altar, serving alongside the priest, that gives you more than just sitting out in the pews with the rest of the laity. And right now, the altar boys have been just torn to shreds from the inside. Now, not necessarily on the altar boys' fault. It's the adults. The ones that are training them, or lack thereof. For instance, most of us are probably familiar with, in most dioceses, I should say, that altar boy training is about an hour once every few months. Where I come from, it was an hour every Sunday. And we're not talking some formalized training. We mean in mass. You are learning by doing. And you did it every week. And you weren't trained on every object, every part of the mass at the same time. No, 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 no. You went in stages. You learned just how to stand on the altar right. How to not fidget. Then you could do some of the smaller things. Maybe it was accepting the gifts. Maybe it was doing water and wine. Maybe it's the patents. Maybe it's the bells. Holding the book. Everything had its own stage. Only your tallest, oldest, strongest boys were allowed to carry in the cross if you didn't have an acolyte or a deacon to do it. Yeah, that's right, an acolyte. Acolytes were meant to be that kind of adult altar boy. Not not some higher rank amongst teenagers. The acolytes were there kind of as a, a cross between basically too old to be an altar boy, but without having the ordination to be a deacon, permanent, or transitionary. And we don't have those anymore either. So who does an altar boy look up to? They've got nobody. In fact, they don't even have adults to tell them how to do things correctly. In some parishes, you have adults being altar boys instead of acolytes, doing the same tasks that they're doing. And I might say, horribly as well. There's a lot of things that I've witnessed over my travels across not just the United States, but the world, that just hurts. I wasn't just an altar boy. I was the trainer of the elite altar boys. When you called one of us in, one of what we refer to as the elites, that was going to be a big deal. That was not to necessarily say that we never got called in we were there all the time usually one or two of us we were always there to to lead the younger ones into becoming the elites because it wasn't just you are or you aren't you are getting there we are getting you to that point but if you had all four of us as all the elites it was usually for your bigger more special masses things like easter sunday christmas those that had a few extra pieces that you didn't see any other times of the year, so you would need a little extra practice getting it done right, because by golly, you had only one chance to get it right. And if you botched it up, trust me, you wouldn't live it down amongst the others. Now that may seem cruel, but that was just the way it was, because we wanted perfection. The altar boys at my home parish were perfection well-oiled machine 
anybody who saw them would be able to instantly recognize that these boys cared about what they did. And they weren't just boys. They were young men. In fact, we had basically had our own little club, cult, whatever you want to call it. We all had our own little group that we'd talk amongst each other after mass, coffee and rolls, while the adults are talking about whatever it is that adults talked about. We were talking about things and boys normally talk about, but sometimes we're talking about how well or how horribly we screwed up. And we made sure that we always got better. Even us, like I said, elites. We knew we weren't the best. Or I should say we were the best, but not necessarily away from improvement. We always could improve. And everything was down to the finest details. So then take a look at some of the churches you go to today. What do you see for your altar boys? Maybe a few ranges and ages. Hey, that's good. We had quite a range of age as well. But take a look at what's underneath the albums. T-shirt and jeans is not acceptable. You're supposed to be wearing your Sunday finest. I've seen sandals, tennis shoes, boots. No, no. Low quarters. Loafers. A.K.A. church shoes. You're going to church. You better look the part. And then what they're actually doing on the altar. For us, like I said, it was basically military precision. For others, kind of bebopping. Maybe paying attention to what's going on. Hands are never folded. If they do the water and wine... They're, they're kind of all up there juggling. Patents. Patents is what we've had basically the last stage. Besides using either the thurifer, that's the incense, or carrying in the crucifix. Those other two, that, that was above that. But since they weren't done every day, we couldn't really assign anyone as as now graduating to it, if you will. I mean, they, they did it if they had the ability to, but we weren't able to train on it all the time. But the patents, the reason that we had that as the last stage is because that was the most important part. And what do I see today? People who don't even know what the patent's there for. Every piece, whether it be water and wine, whether it be the bells, just holding the book, every piece was important to make sure it was mastered. And today, I see people up there with the bells who don't know how to ring them right. Some places they want to do three short bursts, if you will. Cool. It's acceptable. I prefer the one long bell toll. Basically, the bells are ringing as long as the Eucharist is in the air, whether that be Eucharist by body or the Eucharist by blood. While it was in the air, that bell was ringing, which gave the priest the control of how long the bells would ring, not the altar boy. And then you've got patents where people are supposed to be, the altar boys are supposed to put those patents underneath wherever the Eucharist was. From the priest's hand to the communicant's mouth. Hands if you're receiving by hand. But of course, the modern world only wants to receive by hand. So the patent just kind of stays out there trying to figure out what to do. I've seen it many times where I will go up, do it right, kneel, receive on the tongue. And the altar server knowing it's supposed to go under the hands, is trying to go under my folded hands, which I move out of the way so they can get to my throat because they're supposed to follow the Eucharist, not my hands. It's just very, very disturbing to me to see this happening. I mean, seriously. Why aren't we training our altar boys to be the best? Why is it just... Why do they have certificates... Hey, look, you graduated to the next rank. What? No.
No, that was all internal. We didn't praise the altar boys in front of the lady. Hey, look, this is their first time serving. Congratulations. Yay. No. Two things with the altar boy when it comes to the laity. One, they, we need to be visible to them so they know what to do right. Two, everything else we should be invisible. We should not be praising them for being altar boys. Maybe, you know, once in a blue moon, we just have an altar boy day or something. I don't know. We tried that a couple of times just to celebrate how awesome they are. But I don't celebrate the first time someone serves on the altar. In fact, they're usually the only time an altar boy in my home parish was ever congratulated, praised, or whatever for being an altar boy is their final time on the altar because they were graduating from high school. That's right. There is a time when that album comes off and it doesn't go back on again. Not to say that I haven't put it on a few times myself. I have because I had to go to those parishes that didn't have kids at all and we needed an altar server. Right, that's fine. It's acceptable. But if there's kids running around, little boys running around, they should be up there on that altar. Not adults. Young or old adults. doesn't matter. It's supposed to be the young men, the young boys, who are trying to determine whether or not they want to become priests. Maybe they don't see that right away. I mean, I didn't. First time I was serving was about seven, eight years old. I had no idea what was going on. I just followed what I was told. Do this, do this, do this. Okay. But while I was up there on the altar, I watched what the priest was doing. I would look at the books that he read out of and see if there was so much more there than we ever saw in Mass. I mean, you hear him talking. Okay, cool. But then you actually look and see that everything that you're supposed to do, that the priest is supposed to do, is written in there. And that book is thick. And we only ever see him read a couple of pages. Just think about how much more there is to the Mass than we see just from the pews. So when you become that altar boy, you start seeing, hey, this is something interesting. This is something that might be for me. Now, it didn't wind up being the right thing for me to do. Let's face it. There's not everybody can be a priest. If we did, there would be no parents to raise kids. But we need not just more priests, but better priests. And better priests who aren't doing these just absolute atrocious things doesn't start in a seminary. It starts in the pews as a small child with their parents continues on as an altar boy on the altar and then we can get to the seminary.